You're going to want to turn your Bible to Luke chapter 2. Normally I read to you out of the New American Standard Bible. Today our reading is going to be done out of the NIV. Uh, it's a, an extra treat though. I told some of us on Wednesday night, uh, I have a niece. Let me turn my mic on because my voice is kind of weak today. I have a niece that lives in Kiev, Ukraine. And she decided that she wanted to memorize the scripture passage about Jesus' birth. And so we're going to be able to hear her uh, lead us in that. Adam, if you can show my niece Becca, Becca Rainey. Uh, let's go ahead and let her lead us in our Luke scripture reading. Luke 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Caesar Augustus also wanted to know the
He's an inquisitive child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly in his good manners. He's a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote this, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but is troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, Teddy continues to work hard, but his mother's death has been hard and his home life will soon affect him if some steps are not taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and he doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes sleeps in class. He is tardy and could become a problem. Well, it was near Christmas time and the children brought her presents wrapped in colorful paper. Except Teddy, he wrapped his in a heavy brown grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson opened her present and found a rhinestone bracelet with some stones missing and a bottle of, uh, that was only a quarter full of cologne. The other children in the classroom began to laugh, but Mrs. Thompson put the bracelet on and commented about how pretty it was. She also dabbed some of the perfume on her other wrist. And after the party, Teddy Stoddard stayed behind just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. When the children left, the teacher cried. That very next day, Mrs. Thompson took a new interest in teaching her children. She worked especially hard with Teddy, and she worked with him to seem to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, he had become one of the smartest children in the class. A year later, she found a note under her door at school from Teddy telling her that all the teachers, she was his favorite. Six years later, it went by and she got another note from Teddy. He wrote that he had finished high school and was third in his class. And she was still his favorite teacher. Four years later, she got another note letter and met, note and letter saying that he graduated from college, was the highest of honors, and assured Mrs. Thompson she was still his favorite teacher. Several years later, she received another letter telling her how much he appreciated her as a teacher. She was still his favorite teacher, and the letter was signed Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. A year later, Mrs. Thompson received a letter stating that he was getting married. He explained his father died a few years earlier and wondered if she would sit in a pew usually reserved for the family of the groom. Mrs. Thompson did attend the wedding, and on that day she smelled just like she had smelled so many years before, on that last day of school before the Christmas holiday began. And I just, I just wrote this last night as I was reading it over again, we cannot impact the world until we have been impacted by His Word. Listen, it would be easy for us today to come in here and laugh and celebrate and then just go home thinking what a great Christmas message. But I don't want it to be that message today for us. Church, it has to be different. It has to be. Because there are teddies all over our community. There are teddies all over our towns. And if we don't reach out to them, if we're not ready to receive what God gives us, as Mary was ready, as John the Baptist was ready, it's all the stories we talked about this month, God uses people who are ready to receive Him. So the question then is, what made Him ready? So we're going to go back in Luke chapter 1, just identify a few verses there in different places I see and made them ready. So turn back into Luke chapter 1, if you will. Our first verse in Luke chapter 1 is verse 11. Go to verse 11. 111. It says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, and, and uh, his wife Elizabeth. Standing to the right of the altar of incense, Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will, hear, will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. 
and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord, their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now let me tell you what that says to me. That Zacharias and Elizabeth had been praying, they were petitioning, means prayer, they have been petitioning for a very long time for God to do something in their lives that had not happened naturally. They wanted to have children like everybody. They wanted to have a legacy. There was something in their lives that was missing though because we find out early in the scriptures that Elizabeth is barren. That means she can't have children. Somewhere along the way, doctors or whatever it was, they're equal at that time, they were not able to produce a child. And so they went to prayer for God to do something in their lives that they could not do on their own. And I'm guessing today, as we all sit here, that there are many of us who are going through something like this right now. Something that we cannot accomplish on our own, but want to see God overcome in our lives. And what happened here, because we know that they have a child, that God gave them this great miracle, what happened that set them apart from everyone else who was having these problems was that when they got in trouble or they had this, this problem pop up, they went into prayer. And the Bible says that God sent an angel to them and says, I have not forgotten your petitions. And so if we're going to be prepared to receive Christ on this Christmas day, if we're going to be prepared to receive the Lord's message to us of whatever He calls us to, His will in our lives, it's going to be because we have recognized that we need Him to do something we can't do, and we petition the Lord daily for Him to do it. And I tell you, church, if we're going to be that kind of community leader, that leads people to Christ, the group of us, it's going to be because we petition the Lord to do in us what we have yet to do. 124 years we have been in existence, and there are still people in this community need Jesus. Yes, we need help to do what we can't do on our own. In our homes, maybe something you're struggling with. In a group like this, it could be hundreds of things. A student struggling with grades. A student struggling with the ethical decisions that they have to make or moral decisions that they have to make. Work decisions that are coming. There's so many. I could not even begin a name. But whatever it is, the recipe is the same. If you want to see God do what you cannot produce yourself, it is not going to be because you stand by the sidelines and you <coughs> complain. There were plenty of Jews grumbling and complaining that the king had not arrived. And they got nowhere. 500 years, 400 years, 300 years. The intertestamental period continued to go on. But a few people were praying, God, do something. And he did. And he will, in our lives, do something if we'll continue to petition him in accordance with his will. And that is the first thing I see. If we're going to see God do it, it's going to be because we live a life of prayer. We will not build the future of this church, of this community on, with our hands. We've tried. We will build it on our knees because He calls us to do that. So the first thing I see is that God hears our prayers. If you're taking notes and you want to write an outline, then God hears our prayers. And, and it's in accordance with this passage. But now I want you to turn to verse 31, if you can. Verse 31. Because I see a second thing, and that's that God delivers through our faith. Not only does He hear our prayers, but He delivers through our faith. You see what's happened in America today, and in our churches especially, is that we have our faith has waned. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not easy to preach when you got the flu. I apologize for that. <coughs> Listen, our faith is waning. Uh, in the churches across this world, it's waning. We are seeking to see something happen. 
and yet I'm willing to believe it could. <clears throat> Somebody says to you, well, all you can do is pray. And we go, yeah, I know, but dot, dot, dot. That's not an example of faith. Let me show you an example of faith. <clears throat> Verse 31, if you will with me. And behold, you will conceive in your womb. Now this is, an angel appears again to, to Mary. We also know it appears to Joseph. <coughs> and then in verse 31 says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. In verse 33 it says, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. <clears throat> and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. Now listen to this verse. Because <coughs> I believe we've all been in those six verses. But this seventh verse, this one verse right here, is the difference between God using you and God not being able to use you. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. That's what she's saying. Behold, looking married. Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. But what made Mary stand out? What was it about Mary that was usable? God's going to bring a son in you. Yes, you're a virgin, but he's going to work all that stuff out. People won't understand. You're going to be mocked. Well, that scares me a little. God believes in you. I'm your bond servant. Whatever you say, it's done. Church, when God calls us, that needs to be our answer. <coughs> we can no longer say, Lord, if you just give me ten more years, learn a little bit more. Lord, I'm not really the guy who can teach a Sunday school class. <laughs> I, I, got, I laugh. It's, it's so ironic that, that you guys are here with us in this church. Uh, you were on the first search committee to ever bring me to pastor. And I remember that time in life. I, I do. I, I remember the first time someone asked me to step up and teach a group of boys on Wednesday night. I didn't want to. I wasn't even going to church on Wednesday night. I really think the pastor of the church just saw in me someone who he wanted to come more regularly, thank you, Andy. I was going to ask Ricky to do it, but she was asleep back there. <laughs> That's exactly the look she has. So, so they asked me. They said, Kurt, would you be willing to come and help out our boys, Clayton? Clayton is up. Uh, wanting to come back over to the adult class and was willing to train someone. I saw check it out. He was doing the service. Uh, God was still very new in my life at that time. And I went. And I remember this very well because I was not prepared for what happened. First, the Lord touched my life that night, those boys. And there were just a few of them there. David was one that was there. Now he's got four kids. He's been married 10, 15 years. I don't know. Anyway, David was there. Afterwards, Clayton comes up to me and says, well, what did you think, Kurt? I said, I think I liked it. I think I wanted to start working with you. He goes, good. If you have any questions, I'll be over in the adults class. You just go ahead and do whatever you want with them. Good luck. And I was, he was out of there. And it was me and the boys. I had just rededicated my life to the Lord. No clue. But one thing that was going for me at that moment was that I was willing to tell God yes. And God blessed me for 15 years of student ministry because of that decision to join in that class that night. 
My wife would be the first to attest to you. I was not real thrilled with the prospect of giving up another night to the church. But the blessings have been more than I could ever share in all Sundays of my life. Mm -hmm. Don't say no to God. Because His blessings will overwhelm you. I won't even tell you the part of this passage where Mary goes to Elizabeth's house. See, Mary and Elizabeth were related. <clears throat> And when Mary walks in with Jesus in her belly, Elizabeth's baby, John the Baptist, in the womb still himself, <coughs> leaped at the presence of God in their midst. When God begins to do something in your life because you say yes and you have faith to step out just a little bit, it will overwhelm you the blessings that come. You won't have to wonder where they are. You'll have to sit down because they will overwhelm you so much. When I came back here, I hoped that we would have a successful ministry together. I did not know how much you guys would continue to grow in my life. And for those who we have met since we've been back this time, it has been a double blessing for us. And that's just one little example of my life of how God works when He brings you into His will. So don't be fearful of that stepping out point. Angel, I know you were worried about singing. I know you were nervous. But I got some news for you. Where are you at? Not this year. Hey, Angela. I got news for you. We all knew something you did. We knew you'd be amazing today. I'm thankful you stepped out on faith. And for her crew, we now know you as the Walmart triplets. <laughs> that is your official name. It's not great, but it's the one I've given you. You're stuck with it. All right. Well, thank you. Mary had faith. And because of that, God brought Himself <coughs> into the world to save us. Who would not step up for that honor knowing in hindsight what would happen? Looking back, who would not be on the front line saying, Lord, I'll do that. I'll take part in being part of Jesus' family. We'd all do it looking back. One last point. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to the verse 46 of Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> it's not just about our prayer and it's not just about our faith, but it's about praise. And Holly, this is why I love you so much. Because you just bring praise. How God has used you as an encourager to me in praising the Lord. If we're going to be usable by God, we had better be people that understand what praise is. We better understand what it means to praise our Father. Look at verse 46. They call this Mary's song. <coughs> My soul exalts the Lord. And my spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time and all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. Notice that she's writing this. And probably wrote this uh, sometime right after his birth. But, but maybe right before. She's got faith, and her faith is so strong, her prayer life is so strong, her trusting in God is so strong, that it's bubbling out in her parades. When was the last time we, church, you, each of us, just stopped and started talking about how good God is to you, even when you're alone? When you do that, you'll re be reminded You'll be reminded continuously of what He does. And when you remind yourself of what He is doing, you'll also look back to what He's done. And let me tell you, it does not take me a half a second in looking back over the history of my life to see where God has put His massive imprints around me. Church, I'm telling you, you want to see miracles? Just look back if you're a believer. Just turn and look back. Those times when you thought you could not get past point one, point A, point C. You couldn't get past them. We look back now, we don't even remember why we were so worried. 
I have told you time and again how hard my wife and I tried to get to Colorado Springs in 1997. We, the end of the world, if we could not get to Colorado Springs, and I don't even remember why, other than we had some friends there. Instead, God has brought us to a place called Florida, to a city called Crestview, where we found a church who loved us for five and a half years, and then found this church who loved us just a little bit more. And here now, 15 years later, <laughs> loving us, continuing to love us, and being my family, not part of my family, but being my family. I spend more time with you than anyone. When I have Christmas, it's with my family. It's the way it's with you. I have other family coming in. But God does things for us. He does things because of it. His purpose is will. But, but the results should be our praising. Verse 52 says He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who are humble. Who is worried about the future of America when God has already demonstrated He'll bring down rulers from their thrones? Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about the future of America. I'm worried about the future of Kurt Rainey and his family by living presently and sharing with people <coughs> who don't know Jesus. You let them take prayer out of school, I'm going to take it to the students. I'm not worried about not being able to pray in a classroom. I'm going to pray with the kids. You keep them empty classrooms, I'll be standing outside your doors waiting for the kids to come out. We'll do fifth quarters, and we'll go to football games, because you can't keep God down. You only have to change the way we approach the situation. But God is still alive, and the church is still alive. And church, if we can't get excited on the day our Jesus celebrated being born, we cannot be excited at all. And He probably doesn't look at us. A few things I see about the character of God before I lose my voice all the way. I see a few things in Mary's praise that I want to point out to you, church. First is His act of creation. God's not up there some cosmic <coughs> Santa Claus bestowing a gift here and a gift there. God is active. He's active and moving. And the Bible says so, but Mary said it. She said, you have regard for your bond slave. You know what a bond slave, I've shared this with you before, but a bond slave is the one who, uh, that slaves were bought for a period of time, like produce. And then when they were done, their time was over, their use was fulfilled, they would be given an opportunity to be free. And at that time, if they liked their living condition and liked the family, they could then will themselves back to the landowner, the master, forever. And that was called a bond slave. They bonded themselves to their master. And he became a slave for all time. That's the concept behind this. And that's who we should be to Jesus. That's why you see Paul and Mary and, and Luke and others talking about themselves in this manner. Because they freely gave themselves up to the Master. To be a slave for His purpose. <clears throat> for all of us. He has regard for us. The lowliest level slave to the highest level king. He has regard. How can I praise Him? Because He first loved me. A beautiful child song. The second thing I say, the second characteristic is that He's merciful to His people. God shows mercy to us. Hey, listen. So many times I hear people out in the world say, well, how come if He's God and He's so powerful and He can save us all, how can we let some people die? Let me tell you this. God's mercy is not demonstrated by the few who die. It's demonstrated by those He saves. When all of us deserve to die, God offered that we could all be saved. And yet we choose not to know Him, and we freely give ourselves away. But God's mercy is seen in the fact that Kurt Rainey, after sinning so despicably my whole life, had a chance to go to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins, and I was instantly saved for eternity. That is mercy. Amen. Why do we look at it from the other side all the time? You can have your doubts world, I'll have my Jesus. The second, the third thing I see is that He cares for the brokenness of mankind. If you look at verse 33, it's all over that verse. But God cares for the brokenness 
of mankind. Rather it be hunger, which is what it lists in there, or it be thirst, or it be a lack of work, or it be a bad living situation, or a bad relationship. God cares for the brokenness of the world, and His mercy is coming. Pray, have faith, and give Him praise, because He's worth it. It's interesting, there's a story that comes immediately after this passage in Luke. A guy named Simeon. One of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. This guy was a devout Christian, a follower of God his whole life. And all he wanted to do was bless the baby that God had promised him, bless the Messiah. And so he waited his whole life into his 80s plus for one moment with the king. And it happens that God comes and, and, and on the eighth day, the, the baby Jesus was to be circumcised in accordance with the law of the land. And, and it happened. And Simeon who had waited his whole life for this one moment, got to hold the baby Jesus up and pray blessing over him. And then he, he was done. He had waited his whole life for that moment. That moment came and gone in a flash. Do you think he'd do it over again if he could? I guarantee it. I don't know what you do here. Well, I guess I know what all of you do here at this church. I know what you could do at this church. And so do you. And more importantly, so does God. When He calls you to do whatever it is He calls you to do, do it with every ounce of energy you have. And do it, and God will bless my own. The last characteristic I see in Mary's praise is that uh, He cared for the mercy, but He showed mercy care for the brokenness. And in Luke 2, we see that He's given His Son. So I want to look back at Luke 2.10, and we're going to finish with this. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And my little Becca, it's funny, we, we have a nickname for each other. She's my little monkey. I'm, I'm a bigger monkey. Uh, I don't know why she says that. But anyway, um, we were in a Chinese restaurant eating, and they have those little plates mats that show what year you're born, and the little animal you're applying, we're both monkeys. And so it's really that simple a story. But I told her, I said in a text to her, I said I, to my brother who read it to her, I said, you're going to help me tell people about Jesus. And if someone comes to know him, I will let my little monkey know about it. And she said, you're, you're, not, a, you're not a big monkey anymore. You're a big orangutan, Uncle Chip. And so, uh, yeah, I love that little kid. Boy, she is special. Uh, born way so early. Just, I don't know how big she was, three pounds, in a hospital for months. Uh, they made her lungs work. God's a miracle baby sitting up there reading 20 verses, or memorized 20 verses for us. Something that most of us in here would never even consider doing. Oh, God can use children. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Three things the angel promised of Jesus. That he would bring good news. We had that in the Old Testament, by the way, Genesis 3.15. We call it the Evangelion. The evangelism message starts there. That the, 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 children, the, the children that would come from Adam and Eve would someday crush the head of the serpent. Hey, listen, y'all. Go home today and know this. On the time when we celebrate Jesus' uh, birth, the celebration of our relationship with God, being reformed by him. Remember this, there is good news, the devil loses, and God wins. Amen. So we can go home and hope, and we can go home and promise, and if you don't have that hope in the promise, my Jesus is still there for you. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that He's patient and long-suffering, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to have eternal life. The Bible promises that if you don't know Jesus to today, that you can leave here knowing Him, because He's still loving us. He's still active, he's still present, and he's still looking for those who will demonstrate faith. And you can pray to him. How beautiful is that? The second thing you see in Luke 10, a verse, chapter 2, verse 10, is that he brings great joy. I mean, I'll tell you this, God transformed me. I don't have any problem telling you that. You want to know? Grab Adam before he leaves. Ask me, Adam what kind of guy I was before I was running with Jesus. There were a lot of other things I was running, but it wasn't with Jesus. Ask him. They'll tell you, tell them if they ask, Pete. You tell them, brother. Yes, sir. But don't tell them everything. No <laughs> examples. 
<laughs> Just tell him that yes, he wasn't living for the Lord then. <laughs> you don't need to know about my past. God's wiped it away. Amen. It's like that story of the lady that went to, to Dr. Moody all depressed. And, and she said, Dr. Moody, I can't get over the sin in my life. And, and, and Dr. Deal Moody says to her, he says, well, I don't even need to know what your sin is. Just pray that God will forgive it. And then he'll throw it away. She says, I'm not sure that'll happen. He says, I'll tell you what you do. You say that prayer, and I'll come back to you next year, and I'll ask. And so he came back to her the next year, and he asked her, he says, hey, you said the prayer. She says, I said the prayer every day of my life the last year. He says, all right, now I'm ready for you to tell me what that sin was. She says, I don't remember. <laughs> God took it away. Took it out of her memory as well as his own. He does not keep records of us once we become a kingdom dweller. He brings great joy. I'll tell you this, though. As much as I can tell you about my joy, and as much as Adam can tell you about my joy, the person you best may ask is my wife, who had to live with me before Christ, and now still has to live with me. <laughs> but it's better. Right? Yes. Say yes, baby. <laughs> or, or go get the car warmed up. <laughs> that was close. Gently. <laughs> I'm still going to be out in the backyard tonight. All right, here we go. Verse, last one, verse 10. He brought good, good news. He brought great joy, and he does those things. And the third thing is that he is for, and this is the key. Now listen to me, everyone. If you don't hear anything else I say today, listen to this last thing. The Bible says that he is for all the people. There is not one person in here, no matter what you've done. Peter denied Christ at a time when Christ could have used someone standing up for him. Paul, he kind of murdered someone. A lot of them, actually. He led a crew to kind of their job. You know, you have the, the Amish Mafia. That's the show that's out now. I'm not endorsing that one. I'm still endorsing the Duck Commanders and all that stuff. But, but I'm saying, you got the Amish Mafia. Well, Paul was leading the, the, the uh, Pharisaical Mafia, if you will. They were killing Christians. And God saves him and sends him to the Christians the next day. God's got a sense of humor too, by the way. And there are consequences for our sin. But God can use anyone. Right? Moses, the spokesman for God, had led him out of Egypt. God's people. He murdered someone. And he had a stuttering problem. And God said, oh, you got a stuttering problem? I'm going to make you the spokesman for all the kings of the world. I, uh, just go talk to them. I got your back. You see the commercial on TV that said, I got your six. Where we're representing the military. I love that commercial. It's very cool. And we do support our military here. But I'll tell you, as much as we might have those soldiers' backs when they come home from the war, the one who has their back for sure is the Lord God. And I'm telling you this to tell you, this is not a time for us to be soft as Christians. This is not a time for us to take lightly. But God has called us to be ready to receive Him to us. It's Christmas, we're celebrating what He already did, what He already came, but church still today, we are celebrating what God is doing. And so I believe this, and all of us should believe this, that if we're struggling in our lives right now, if we will pray and have faith and give praise, we can trust God's will to be done. Whatever our situation Whatever our situation, you can't trust God. 